Okay, Ron, we might, um, we might make a start if I can have your attention. Um, look, may I start uh, by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land we're meeting on tonight, the Tasmanian uh, Aboriginal people, and pay my respects to uh, the Aboriginal community, its elders past and present. Uh, the Wilderness Society recognises that this land was stolen and never ceded, and uh, for those members of the Tasmanian Aboriginal community in the audience tonight, we uh, acknowledge and salute you. Uh, look, welcome uh, tonight and thank you very, very much for coming. My name's Vicar Bailey, I'm the Campaign Manager for the Wilderness Society, and on behalf of the Wilderness Society and uh, BirdLife Taz, and you'll meet Eric later on, welcome to this event and thanks very much for coming. I hope you find it really informative. Um, in a bit of a coup, uh, I guess we uh, got First Dog on the Moon to agree uh, to host us tonight, uh, all round uh, parrot lover, um, you know, a cartoonist, you know, a national cartoonist who uh, is regularly articulating and commenting on uh, issues to do with the environment, our species, our laws and so forth. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, First Dog on the Moon to the podium to run us through this evening. Thanks very much. Hello. Thank you for having me. Uh, sorry about the single-use plastic. Um, I'm First Dog on the Moon, and I'd like to welcome everyone to this event, including uh, the live stream from uh, Launceston. Um, I don't know, they, we can't hear them. Can they, can they hear us? I, I hope they can. It's, it's too late if they can't. <laughs> I think there are 40 or more people in the Wilderness Society Campaign Centre there, and... Um, all right, let's get started. Parrots, how good are parrots? This, this is a Science Week event, um, one of hundreds across the country celebrating science and scientists. Um, of course, we all know that every week should be Science Week, but uh, while scientists are good at science, they're really terrible at PR. <laughs> Just ask climate scientists. Um, so it's going to be up to me to do it. I have two sets of notes because Vicar kept sending me updates after I wrote all these jokes. A little, bit of, <laughs> a little bit of housekeeping. There are donation buckets at the door, um, and all the donations will be going to the next Difficult Birds fundraiser. Can't, should I kind of push this button? Oh. Hey, all right. <laughs> Uh, they will be funding Zorro the sniffer dog to identify the nesting trees of the masked owl, specifically the vomit of the masked owl. Now this, this is Zorro who, with your financial assistance, will dedicate the rest of his life to hunting down bird bath. So if Zorro can make this sacrifice, uh, and in fact Zorro's parents are here this evening, Nick and DC, if you want to stand up and get a round of applause for dedicating so no doubt the next 20 years of your lives will be spent chasing bird bars as well, <laughs> um, which is admirable. So if Zorro can make this sacrifice, uh, at least you can put some money in the bucket on the way out. Tonight we will be hearing from some of the best parrot scientists in the country, if not the world, and a lawyer, Jess. Uh, <laughs> I can't remember when I first heard about the orange-bellied parrot um, and how bad it was at not staying endangered, um, but I've spent a fair bit of time with, with some of the, ah, the empty husks of people <laughs> that have been reduced to, to working on these, these ridiculous birds. It's not just the orange bird parrot, but that bird weighs 46 grams and flies across Bass Strait twice every year. That's right, isn't it? Yes, or it tries to at least. And why, <laughs> why would you, all right? Uh, I mean, that's probably a better choice than going on the spirit of Tasmania. <laughs> but even so, if I weighed 46 grams, I would just stay at home. <laughs> uh, but that's what they do, and so do the swift parrots. Uh, if the swift parrots would just nest on broody, they'd be fine, but they uh, have to nest where the sugar gliders are, and so people have to build light-activated possum keeper outers. Now, I think the Hodgman government wanted to log Bruni Island, and I, I was going to have a group I'm new to Tasmania and I was going to have a group boo for the Hodgman government, but I might leave that for after I've hosted a few of these and seen if, <laughs> if that's the sort of thing people do. Um, hello, everyone from Depipwi. Uh, 
I've been to Melaleuca a couple of times on the tiny plane, full of, uh, plane of death, and it really is a privilege to be able to go down there. Um, so I, I suppose the thing for me, the, the saddest thing is how difficult it must be to work every day. And I mean, perhaps many of you work in similar areas where you're working every day, toiling away to keep some ungrateful animal like the orange-bellied parrot or the swift parrot or the I don't know, 40 spotted partalope alive. Um, and they try their best to, to well, there's so many obstacles to doing that. Um, and I, I, I would have a lot of feelings about it. I do have a lot of feelings about it. Um, and I, I don't have to go and talk to these birds every day. So it must be hard for all these scientists and the lawyer. Um, <laughs> so I think, I think we owe a debt of gratitude to these lovely people. Um, we're going to hear from our first scientist this evening, Dr. Shannon Troy, originally from Adelaide, but that's okay. A lot of us from somewhere else. <laughs> After some time with Forestry South Australia, Dr. Troy uh, had her first job working directly with wildlife, catching koalas on Kangaroo Island. <laughs> that's a good joke. <laughs> that even tried. This turned into academic research looking into movement ecology and conservation genetics. Uh, he did a stint studying here and then moved sensibly to Tasmania permanently, completing a PhD on the spatial ecology and habitat preferences of the spotted tail quoll, which is a wonderful animal. We have some at our house, or at least near our house. Uh, since finishing that, has been working with the Department of Primary Industries, Parks, Water and the Environment, also known as DEPIPRI, which is a great acronym. Perhaps we could all say it together. I really like that one. one. DEPIPRI. <laughs> Uh, we didn't, I'm, from, I'm from Victoria previously and we didn't have anything like that there. <laughs> For the past four years, Dr. Troy has been working on the orange-bellied parrot. Four years. And last year became the official wildlife biologist on the orange-bellied parrot Tasmania program. So we have to be nice to her or she will probably burst into tears. She <laughs> will be talking about the ecology of and threats to the OBP past population trends, their current status and what we are planning this season and into the future to try and reverse their decline. Dr. Sh Dr. Shannon Troy. Thank you. Thank you for the lovely introduction. I don't usually cry in winter. I save that for the summer when <laughs> I'm working with the birds. <laughs> winter is my respite. Uh, yes, so today I am speaking on behalf of the Depipwe Orange Belly Parrot Tasmanian Program. Um, I just wanted to introduce my awesome team who are not speaking, but some of them are here. Um, so we have three people working on project management, um, including the section and also building the new breeding facility at Five Mile. Um, and the fellow in the middle, Matt, is helping me build some new aviaries down in the southwest. Um, I figured if he can build a toilet on Federation Peak, he can probably build me an aviary. Um, this is our captive team, so we have eight staff working in the captive facility, um, which holds about 190 birds. Um, we have three vets. Um, I think all the vets currently are part-time vets. Um, Annie in the middle has also been employed in the past as a tree climber solely before she became the vet on the program, so she's my favourite multi-talented vet because she can also get up the trees for me. Um, I work on the WILD program, I say on my own, but I don't because I have Dee um, and his people most of the summer these days, which is fantastic. And I also have around 30 volunteers a year stationed down at Melaleuca doing feed table observations. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge two previous Depipwe staff members, uh, Mark Holdsworth and Peter Brown. Um, they've been working on the program since, or well, Peter since the 70s and Mark soon after, um, and they collected a lot of the long-term data that I'm using and presenting today. Um, and they also set up the monitoring program, so massive contribution. So I'm just going to run through the larger recovery team. I'll talk a little bit about the orange-bellied parrot's ecology, uh, run through the status um, and past population trends, uh, give a little update on the population and what we've been doing the last few years, uh, and then talk about what we're planning this season. So this slide's massive, and you don't need to read it all. Um, the main point is that the orange-bellied parrot is migratory, and that means um, there's people in New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia, and Tasmania working on it, both in the wild, um, on its habitat, on its populations, doing releases, and also captive breeding. We also draw on the expertise of 
vet experts across the country, captive management experts across the country, um, researchers. So I think in total there's about 32 people on the recovery team at the moment um, and then a whole bunch of other people who contribute who aren't on it. It makes decision making um, complex and that's actually a good thing because this, in this species there's often not a clear answer and we're, we're weighing up the pros and cons of different management actions um, and having the um, opinion of multiple experts allows us to kind of weigh up the best option. It not, might not be 100% right. So for those of you who are into Latin, um, Neofema chrysogaster is the species name. It's a 45-ish gram budgie. Um, I often get asked if it's the one that's being chomped on by the sugar gliders, the swift parrot, it is not. Um, I also get asked, <laughs> sorry, I didn't take much joy in that, but um, <laughs> I also quite often get a lot of people thinking that it's a blue wing parrot um, because orange belly parrots also have blue wings and uh, blue wing parrots also have orange bellies. They look quite similar, but as you can see, uh, it's not. Um, they're a ground feeding seed eating parrot and they're fire fire dependent, so they prefer to eat seeds in button grass plains in Tasmania that have been burnt less than eight years ago, which worked really well when there were Aboriginal people on the land burning. Um, in European times, a little more challenging. Um, they now breed only at Melaleuca in the Tasmanian Wilderness World Heritage Area down in the southwest of the state. Um, they breed in hollows. In the wild, they produce up to six eggs and are around three fledglings per year. Um, they live for about 2.2 years on average, um, but we do have a 12-year-old bird in the population at the moment. Um, and they're migratory, as I said, so they, they, they move from southwest Tasmania, where they're breeding in summer, up into Victoria, um, where they spend the winter uh, on coastal mainland, um, also coastal South Australia and New South Wales. Um, so this is just kind of running through uh, the different threats to the species. So the circles are the different things that threaten them. Um, probably in the 1770s, at the time of European settlement, when they had a very large population, um, the biggest threats were um, collection for museums and by naturalists, um, habitat loss and habitat degradation. As the population became smaller, these threats became more of a problem. Um, so. Now we have issues with a small population size, so we've got genetic problems. They're more susceptible to diseases. They're more um, likely to have inbreeding depression. Barriers to migration become more of an issue. Every bird that doesn't make it across the Bass Strait is important. Um, disease could wipe out the entire population in one go. Um, stochastic events, which is just a fancy word for random environmental things happening. So one fire at Melaleuca in the last remaining population, and it's done. Um, hybridisation with other species, so the blue wing parrots are quite similar. We don't have many female orange-bellied parrots. The males might decide they like the, the blue wings better. Um, so we start to lose orange-bellied parrots. And also our conservation actions. We've got to be really careful in that trying to fix this species and trying new things that we don't accidentally uh, do things that will harm the population. So a quick timeline um, of important orange-bellied parrot events. Um, they were first collected in New South Wales and Tasmania uh, in the 1770s and they were reported to be quite abundant then. In the 1880s they were still reported as abundant, or lots as I've said here, um, but it was also noted that everyone was shooting these little birds. Um, in 1917 they were reported as um, starting to become rare everywhere and gradually becoming extinct. Um, and the 1970s had the first population census and they were down to less than 200 birds at that point. Um, to Pip, we did the first systematic surveys in the World Heritage Area in 1979, um, and following that established a captive population, uh, recovery team, recovery plan, um, and it was realised that the other breeding population, Birch's Inlet, had gone extinct. Um, intensive demographic monitoring of survival and breeding started at Melaleuca between 1988 and 1992. Um, in the following decade, there was an attempt to re-establish Birch's Inlet population and over 350 orange-bellied parrots were released at that time, but it ultimately failed and the population went extinct. Uh, at the same time, Melaleuca population was declining by about 12% a year. Uh, and by 2017, which was last breeding season, we had 19 orange-bellied parrots uh, return to Melaleuca for breeding, um, of which three were female. So it's been a, a pretty quick decline. Um, I'll just quickly run you through how we do the population monitoring. So we have leg mads on each bird with colours and letters. That allows us to identify each individual bird. Um, volunteers do observations at the feed table for two hours twice a day, and that gives us data on survival and breeding participation. 
And we also monitor nest boxes, um, the birds that are using them and also their contents, so eggs and nestlings and fledglings, and that allows us to check how reproduction's going. Uh, so number of orange-bellied parrots returning to Metaleuca since 1992, so that's been derived from those feed table data, uh, and you can see it was popping up around 100 birds until about 2002, and then we had that really sharp decline down to 2010. Since 2010, the population's been pretty stable, actually, so there's this idea that they've really declined in the last few years, and that's not actually the case. It's been in the last seven or eight years. What has changed is the number of females in the population, which you can see here in red. So we're down to only two or three females, and that's the real issue, that we don't have the breeding pairs that we need. So to try and adjust, uh, to try and recover the population, we release birds from captivity, and I'll switch between calling the release birds and translocated birds. Um, and the aim of this is to try and increase the number of pairs that are breeding in the population and to balance the sex ratio, so to give those males some females to mate with. Um, people often ask, are there enough birds in captivity to do this? And the answer is yes. We have 390 birds at six different institutions um, in three different states, four different states. Um, we select birds for release by their relatedness to one another, by their behaviour, so whether they um, act like wild parrots or whether they've adjusted to captivity too much, and also their health. So birds are quarantined and disease screened for approximately three to four months before they're released. So the birds that we were released this year have been in quarantine since early July. Um, so birds are transported to Melaleuca um, via Melbourne if they're coming from the mainland um, and then to Hobart and then popped onto a small plane um, in boxes and taken down to Melaleuca where they then go into the pre-release aviary. They're held for four to seven days um, and then they're at soft release which means they can continue to access the aviary after they're released and we think that helps their survival. So how's this all working? Um, so we've released between 13 and 27 individuals each spring since 2013. There's been no difference in the survival of males and females at translocation, so that's the two weeks following their release. They've all, males and females have survived at about the same rate. Um, the season, so that's up until March when it's time to migrate. But you can see their annual survival, so their migration survival, is very low. There's no difference between males and females, but it's only around 10%, and a, and a wild adult is actually up around 60% survival. Um, which is shown in this graph. So you can see, um, sorry, that's not shown in this graph. Um, within the season at Melaleuca, so the birds that we release are the captive birds, the birds that return on their own are the wild birds, and you can see at Melaleuca there's no difference in the survival of captive birds and wild birds. So the birds that we release are quite good at acting like a wild bird at that point, but when it's time to leave and migrate, their survival is very low. So wild adult survival is up around 0.65. Captive adult survival is down around 0.1. Um, and juvenile survival is also um, quite low. Interestingly, the yellow dots show the historic survival rates. And you can see the adults are surviving in the same way that they used to. So they're still quite good at migrating. But wild juveniles have gotten worse at migrating. So we're having a lower survival rate of juveniles in the population, which means the population's aging. So this yellow square shows you the last um, year since we've been doing the releases. Um, the line shows the number of nests each year. So you can see around the same time as that decline in the population size, the number of nests decreased, which is what you'd expect. Um, since we started releasing birds, the number of nests initiated has increased. So in that respect, the releases are working. Um, the number of eggs laid has decreased in the last few years. And to begin with, we thought maybe that was the captive birds not doing a very good job at laying eggs and it brought the whole average of the population down. But when we looked at the nests that were parented by captive males, parented by wild males, parented by captive females and parented by wild females, there's no dis difference. So although the number of eggs laid per nest has decreased, it's not necessarily because of the captive bird. There's some other bigger issue going on. You see there's a similar trend for hatching success. So hatching success, the number of eggs per nest that hatch has decreased, but it's not a result of the captive birds. The hatching rates have decreased for the wild birds as well. And the same trend with fledglings per nest. So the number of birds that fledge the nest and become wild birds 
has decreased in the last four years, but it's not due to the captive birds, it's across the board. So this is a bit of a worrying trend. It would almost be better if it was just all the captive birds' fault. Um, it, it would be clear what's going on, but there's obviously a larger population issue happening now. So what we've learned the last few years is that a high rate of orange-bellied parrots survive the translocation, and the captive birds that we release survive at Melaleuca as well as the wild birds that we release. And they breed as well as the wild birds currently, but not historically. Um, we know that captive orange-bellied parrots don't migrate as well as the wild orange-bellied parrots, um, but their young do, and we know that orange-bellied parrot breeding and survival have both decreased recently, so we have to try and manage these threats. Um, there was a bit of some, it's been some highlights uh, in the newspapers the last four years that have been great, really um, interesting headlines. Um, one of the things um, that repeatedly comes up is that releasing captive birds doesn't work, um, and in fact that they're morons because they can't migrate. But hopefully, um, <laughs> What I've shown you is that captive orange-bellied parrots have actually prevented extinction of the wild population the last three, few years through their breeding, but they do migrate very poorly. So if we just concentrate on doing translocations alone, we're not gonna save the species. We need to think about the other things that we can do to supplement this. So um, we're predicting this year that we'll have 19 to 20 orange-bellied parrots back. Um, and only four to five of them will be females. So this is based on the long-term data and the birds that left. So usually in September, people start to freak out. Oh my God, there's only three or four female parrots. What are we gonna do? And we say, yes, well, we knew this since last April and we've had female birds in quarantine since July to try and adjust this. So we're gonna continue to release adult birds in spring to try and balance the sex ratio and increase breeding. With the birds are in quarantine now, health screening's underway. We're gonna start recapturing these captive birds at the end of the breeding season. Instead of just letting them migrate on their own and die, we'll put them out, we'll let them breed, and then we'll recapture them, put them back into captivity. They can go back out again next year, and that helps to bolster the numbers in the captive population. We're gonna do the same thing with about 50% of the wild juveniles for the next few years too, because they're just not returning at the rates that we need to grow the population. So this will buy us some more time to try and address the survival problems at the landscape scale. And um, with ANU's help, we're gonna try and keep re improving the reproductive output in nests um, through intensive nest monitoring, rescuing eggs and nestlings that are ailing, um, and translocating and transferring eggs and nestlings from captivity to the wild and between nests in the wild. And then the bigger picture, how are we gonna try and fix the survival problems? Uh, one of them is to keep doing ecological burning at Melaleuca. So we're now working closely with the Parks and Wildlife Service to make sure that the burn plans are implemented. Um, we achieved one and a half fires before it started raining last March, and we're aiming for another two burn units to be done this year. This will increase the amount of seed in the landscape for orange-bellied parrots to eat, and hopefully increase um, nestling condition and juvenile survival. We're gonna try releasing different types of birds. So juveniles, maybe they'll do better than adults that have spent their life in captivity and at different places. So instead of having one population at Melaleuca, we're gonna try and establish a few other places nearby so that if we do have some random problem at Melaleuca, every single bird in the wild is not there. Uh, we're gonna start using radio telemetry to track the birds um, and understand their survival, where they're going in the landscape when they're not at a feed table and which habitats they're using. Um, there's releases being done on the mainland to try and form flocks. So the idea there is that the juveniles will fly across and they'll actually be able to find where good habitat is because they'll be attracted by a large group of birds. At the moment, they're attracted by two or three birds and we just don't think they're finding them and that's why the juveniles aren't surviving. And to Pip, we are expanding the captive population to allow for more of these releases with the new breeding facility at Five Mile. Um, yeah, and the last things we'll be doing is continuing to work together with ANU, with Parks, with the recovery team, coordinated recovery efforts across the range. So no one institution alone is going to save the orange-bellied parrot. Science is not going to save the orange-bellied parrot. Volunteers are not going to save the orange-bellied parrot. We need to do it together. Um, but we need to keep up the science and keep monitoring what's working and what isn't. Thank you. We're going to have a Q&A later, um, and it will be questions and answers, not comments and answers. Um, thank you, Shannon.
Uh, our next speaker is Matt Webb. It says here, one of the biggest challenges facing species across the world is habitat loss, um, and Tasmania's parents are no exception. Um, now, just before I introduce Matt, uh, it's worth highlighting a recently established Senate inquiry into Australia's faunal extinction crisis, being chaired by Senator Janet Rice, with three other members, all Tasmanian senators, Ann Urquhart from the ALP, John O'Dunium uh, from the Liberal Party, and Steve Martin, who is a national, so he'll be able to help. Um, the process is accepting public submissions until September 10, and we'd like to urge you all to make a submission. Use the parents as a case, everything you've learned here. Hands up from anyone who's made a submission so far. All right. That's two, three, anyone planning to? That's just about, oh yeah, all right. That's not bad. More of you should put your hands up for that sort of thing. Um, I first met Matt when he took a group of people from the First Dog on the Moon Institute to see Eastern Barred Bandicoots. Um, we were very excited uh, and were prepared for a daunting, daunting nighttime trek into the wilderness. He met us early in the evening in South Hobart um, and we climbed into his old truck. Uh, and before long, we were out in the bush but then just as quickly we were back in the suburbs and he parked behind the amenities block of a football oval near a school after hours and we thought we were going to be murdered. Um, <laughs> but no, we wandered around for a bit and there they were, Eastern Bar Bandicoots, just on the oval like that, bandicooting about. Um, and we realised then that Hobart, that Tasmania's not like other places, you can, you can see bandicoots at the shops. Um, now Matt uh, is uh, a conservation biologist with a focus on conserving Australia's threatened species, worked on many large scale and long term monitoring programs in various ecosystems around Australia and its offshore islands, a particular interest in addressing conservation challenges posed by highly mobile, rare or elusive species for which ecological data is often lacking but um, effective conservation planning is vital, like the extremely unhelpful and possibly quite stupid swift parrot. For over a decade, Matt has led swift parrot research work in Tasmania, sampling over 2,000 sites, developing the ability to predict where birds may breed in future and understand how severe nest predation by the introduced sugar glider varies over time and space. The little bastards look adorable, but they're vicious killers. Can we all boo the sugar glider? Boo! <laughs> Oh. <laughs> Engagement with regulators and land managers over habitat has quite literally driven Matt mad, and yet he's come along this evening anyway. He's going to share some of these experiences to tell us about the special ecology of swift parrots and its very, 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 very specific habitat needs. Will you tell us where they're going to nest this year? No. <laughs> All right. Is it a secret or you just don't know? I haven't decided whether to use this. Or maybe I should try. I'll give it a go. I don't. Does that work? I don't. That works. Okay. Okay. So swift parrots are another special little bird, like OBPs, where um, they're one of the only migratory parrots uh, in the world, um, and. A really important point is they only breed in Tasmania. So this is it for, uh, for them. I actually have to stay over here, don't I? To, how do I click through? OK. So um, what swift parrots need is actually, it's actually really quite simple. They need flour for, um, for food and they need tree hollows for nesting. Um, but it gets a bit more complex um, later on. But generally, uh, you know, high quality swift parrot habitat looks something like this. Um, but we have a tendency to turn it into this. Um, and it's not very, they don't really like that very much. So, yeah, their primary threats are habitat loss and predation by sugar gliders. Um, I'll let Deal talk about um, 
or Diane will talk about sugar gliders. I'll just concentrate on um, habitat loss. And so this map up, um, yeah, I'll just find the pointer. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so this yellow line is where most of the swift, of swift the swift park population breeds. Um, up in the northwest, um, this is largely stuffed. Like there's basically almost no habitat uh, left. You know, you get a handful of birds and a few little pockets. So really, we're we're relying on this east coast and particularly this you know this sort of area. And now all of that red. Um, that's from a, a spatial layer of forest loss since roughly since about uh, 97, so when the previous RFA started or was signed, and that's what we've done to the state since then. There's a few there's a few areas on there that um, can, are attributable to fire, um, but within the Swift Parrot Range. Uh, way over 90% of that red is attributable to clearfell logging. So it doesn't even pick up a lot of um, selective harvesting or whatever. Uh, you know, we've really gone hard. And in the last 10 years in particular, in the southern forests. Um, and I'll just point out, so that, so Bruny Island and Mariah Island, they're the only two places that um, you know, that are glider-free breeding habitat for the species. How do I do this again? Oh. How do I do it, Vika? Just Next. Next. <laughs> okay, so habitat loss, it's been, you know, it's clear, it's just been extreme. Um, and it's gotten to the point where, in most years, breeding habitat is limiting. Uh, you know, it's a hard thing to prove definitively, but yeah, you know, realistically, it is. And you'll see some of the stuff that uh, that I show you later sort of demonstrates that. But um, you know, if, if I had to have a guess, I would say we we have less than five percent of pre-European settlement uh, of the habitat. I'd say we'd be, we'd be lucky if we even had that, actually. Um, so to try and work out what was uh, going on, try and work out better management strategies for them, in 2009, um, I, we um, started a population monitoring program for the species to just try and better understand what was... Um, just what was going on with them, uh, how to better better manage manage them. This was started with while I was working with De Pipwe, but later on we had a bit of a falling out, and De Pipwe doesn't want to work on swift parrots anymore. But that's all right. I work for ANU now. Um, everything's fine. Um, so. There's two components to, uh, to the population monitoring. I'll just talk about the first one for um, uh, tonight. So we survey a 1,000 sites early in the breeding season. Each site has, has to have at least one blue gum or black gum. They're, they're primary food trees. We do repeated site visits, um, just f quick five-minute site visits. Uh, we record presence and the number of parrots, and we also record flowering intensity. Just, it's just a crude measure from zero to four, and I clearly don't do all this by myself, and I can see a few faces in the crowd of people who, have ta who I torture, uh, who help me, and thank you very much to them. Um, but we've been doing this since 2009, uh, every year. And what we do with the data, uh, this is just an example of, um, so we build spatial, let's just call them spatial models. Um, and up the top, uh, so this green is flowering. Um, 
and it's like a let's just call it a moving average but effectively the um this shows where most of the flowering was in each uh year and you can see the birds usually correspond to where the flowering was um, this year 2010 was an exceptional year we've only had one other year like that um, in well over a decade where flowering was probably um, there was probably more flower than the birds could use uh, but generally you know in years like like this you know they're super restricted and even in years like this that looks like a larger area but that's actually up in the eastern tiers and there's not very much um, uh, foraging habitat up there because, and to demonstrate that, what we've done with the, these models then is applied a threshold to, um, uh, to these spatial models to which basically these maps identify where the the bulk of the population is each in each year. And part of the reason for doing this was to come up with better management strategies for, for the species. So you can't manage just the entire breeding range as one unit. You need to manage like you know, that as one unit and you know, Bruny Island as one unit. And we also did this to, to just get a better handle on like the relative availability of of the functional habitats so you can have heaps of food in one area but if there's no tree hollows then there's, there's not much use to them and uh you know the, the same uh, vice versa um it's interesting to point out 2014 this was the worst year that uh that we've seen but um just around, for example, here, it's around Rebbin, there was hundreds of uh, swift parrots just relying on a handful of, um, uh, of flowering blue gums. And then down around Southport, around Ida Bay, hundreds, again, relying on uh, flowering black gum. But uh, effectively, most of the population didn't breed in that year. In the other component of the the survey, we actually go and survey nesting habitat. And in that, uh, well, for example, in 2014, we surveyed in a really large areas of nesting habitat surrounding those um, where the birds were feeding and they just weren't any, any swift parrots. They'd, they'd just sort of given up. There wasn't enough food. Now, this, this spins me out, um, even though I made this slide, but, but every time I look at this, so this is where they spend the winter. So that's the non-breeding non season uh, distribution. And these birds migrate like OBPs, you know, then possibly not very smart, down to Tasmania to breed. And this, this is sort of relatively to scale. This is the sort of areas that they're relying on uh, in, in any given year. And as you'll see in a second, we're still, we still haven't quite cottoned on to what to do about that. But so ultimately, so the, the, the birds have a spatial dependency on flower, particularly when breeding. Only a fraction of the breeding range is suitable each year because of these var variations in flowering patterns. And flowering determines the availability uh, of nest sites. So these are really key things for, uh, for management. And although they're, they're highly mobile, like OBPs, once they start nesting, they just, they're not really that mobile anymore. They, you know, all the food needs to be within you know, approximately five k's of the nest and you know that goes on for a couple of months so that that mobility um so they've lost it while on 
mainland on the mainland while they're overwintering they can sort of track food resources even though the mainland has been hammered as well um, this is just one of the, the things that I've been working on lately and it, I love this because it's really simple um, statistics rather than really complex ones like some some of those uh, spatial models involve. But um, along the x-axis, along the bottom, that's the proportion of the thousand uh, sites that are, that are occupied uh, each year. And then on the y-axis is um, mean abundance of birds at a site given that birds were present. And you can see, like it's a really tight relationship. Um, effectively, the less, the fewer sites occupied, which is a, fu is a function of um, availability of flower, the greater the, the mean abundance of birds you, f you find at a site. Um, initially, when I uh, produced this, I thought, oh, that actually looks quite good. But then, first of all, um, uh, yeah, you can see I've only gone up to 2015 uh, and uh, in the process of properly sort of analysing the last two years' data and that's these red dots. And so it's really like a, it's uh, about as strong a evidence as you can get for, you know, we're, we're seeing the decline that was predicted um, well, that we predicted a few years ago. Uh, how fast that happens is going to be determined, you know, uh, yeah, what happens for, from here. But this is really concerning. And then when I plotted them out in the actual time series, I sort of went, oh, and realised that it actually, the overall over that entire time, the general trend is, is down. But, um, but we can still do something about these guys. But compared to OBPs, we've got um, a lot better chance. But we've got to stop doing this. Um, why, you know, why is forest policy failing the swift bat? Because um, it really is. Um, and just as an example, so one of the key breeding areas that, um, uh, that the parrots rely on is the southern forests. In some years, you know, almost the entire population relies on the southern forests. It's the only area that's flowering. And uh, during the previous RFA uh, with Clearfield, 33% of the eucalypt forest that was remaining um, at that point and oh, uh, yeah. and we've also uh, clear felled uh, about a quarter of nesting uh, habitat so like in a 20 year period it's pretty obvious that we've kind of got to stop soon um, and just remember, this is of what was remaining in 97. You know, there's, most of it was actually, well, an awful lot of it was actually gone uh, prior to that. I can change it with this, can I? Yeah. Uh, this is just one of the many known breeding locations logged um, last summer. Uh, this is, you know, in full knowledge, uh, non nest sites, non foraging sites. Um, we've got over a decade worth, uh, worth of data uh, demonstrating this. Um, so, non nests are being destroyed, non habitats being destroyed. Um, you know, there's no uncertainty anymore. For a long time, there was uh, you know, uncertainty was used as an excuse because it, you know, People would say, oh, the birds can just, they can go somewhere else, can't they? But as I was showing you before, the flowering patterns, um, you know, don't allow them to go somewhere else in most, in most years. And 
an interesting thing about all of this as well is, um, you know, the government uh, business enterprise um, is trying to get FSC certification at the moment, and it just, uh, I, I just don't get it, uh, really, how, how we can be, still be doing this, but be sort of dreaming that we can um, uh, get Forest Stewardship Council certification. So, where to from here? Um, well, I know that it, there's, there's people trying to, to work out, um, yeah, what is the balance? Um, uh, you know, ca can we protect the, the remaining habitat in some of these areas? But currently, if you look at, at uh, Sustainable Timber Tasmania, FT, um, if you look at their three-year plan, um, there's still a whole lot of areas of swift parrot habitat that are earmarked for, for logging. A lot of them are contingency coops, but I've seen plenty of contingency coops um, harvested before. But uh, it's just, it's still, yeah, one hand doesn't know what the other's doing. Uh, but hopefully we'll get there. We've got a better chance than OBPs. Um, it's, it's about us. <laughs> uh, was it? Oh, yeah, what can we do? Well, for a start, we can implement existing management plans that have been, that they're like a decade old. And these would go a long way to, um, uh, to you know, stop halting the decline of the species or preventing its ex extinction. Um, you know, it's amazing that these plans have been around for a decade and sometimes they're applied, sometimes they're not. None of them are endorsed. You, you know, you spend years making, making a plan uh, or developing a plan and then it, uh, yeah, government's not willing to endorse it. Uh, we need to document cumulative, cumulative loss, like in the, uh, those sl that slide I showed you before of loss in the southern forests. That's the first documentation of, of loss. So we know that we've lost heaps. But, um, but because we don't, ha haven't been documenting it, it's, um, you, you have this thing called a shifting baseline where it's always, well, surely they don't need all of it. And you know this is going to come down to to a point where you know we've got ten trees trees left, and it's like well surely they don't need all of it. Surely we can take you know take some, and then you know, ultimately this is it. It requires currently commitment from the Tasmanian government. That's where that's where it all comes back to, and you know it's the RFA. The RFA supersedes EPVC Act. Um, which Jess will talk about uh, later. I think that was my last slide. Sorry if I went over time. Yeah. Hello. Thank you, Matt. More chance than the OBP. Well, that's good. Um, Dan Stoyanovich, my friend D, who I think I first met up a tree. He was up a tree, I wasn't. Um, so I did want to mention uh, the Difficult Bird Research Program, which is very exciting um, and includes, well, difficult birds and the, the scientists who are uh, who are working to save them. And I think uh, Zorro is a, a member of the Difficult Bird Group, um, where Dee's just going to talk a bit about, <coughs> well, not actually about Zorro, but uh, there will be, for those people, oh no, in Launceston, everyone's got a bucket, but for people watching the stream online, there will be a link where you can donate. Difficultbirds.com. Difficultbirds.com. Go to difficultbirds.com. <laughs> It's a great website, and you'll find a link to donate money to help uh, Zorro spend his life looking for owl vomit. Um, 
And that's because I, and I'm taking credit for this, John Kadelka and I crowdfunded a whiskey tour of Tasmania and we got thousands of dollars from the internet. Um, and Dee and Henry thought, hell, if those idiots can do that, we can do it for something worthwhile um, and have been ripping off our idea ever since. Uh, so, so Diane is a conservation scientist interested in the factors that affect small and declining populations and is the lead postdoc of the... Oh, I didn't know you were the lead postdoc of the difficult position. Right. OK. Um, I remember you undertaking your PhD research on the breeding biology of the endangered swift parrot in the Tasmanian breeding range. Uh, and this research was the first to apply new technology and analytical tools to address a major gap in knowledge about one of Australia's most threatened birds. Um, D specialises on species traditionally considered difficult to study. Uh, and I had a list of them. It's a great list. It's got the, the 40 spotted pardalote. And what's that honey eater? We work on regent honey eaters. Regent honey eaters. Then, oh, good. OK. Um, uh, and there was another one, but I can't remember what it was. But anyway, um, we... Oh, the scrub tit. Yes, that was it. Yes. We should save the scrub tit. Is the video ready to go? All right. But before that, we've got a little multimedia extravaganza. This is literally shamelessly piggybacking on the... Uh on the opportunity. The last three years, you've helped us build nest boxes for endangered Tasmanian birds, helped us implement an emergency intervention to save orange-bellied parrots, and we've saved swift parrot nestlings from being eaten in their nest boxes by predatory sugar gliders. We're coming to you again to help us save another difficult bird. Tasmanian mast owls are endangered, and we barely know anything about them because they're so hard to find. Finding mast owls is so hard that we've had to get creative. That's why we're coming to you for help again. We need your help to train Zorro, the owl detector puppy, into a new hero for mast owl conservation. A detector dog could find an owl-scented needle in a haystack. We want to use this amazing skill to help us discover new information about what mast owls need to survive and how we can help prevent their extinction. Help us to help mast owls with adorable science. <laughs> oh. Thank you. It's literally shameless plugging for uh, our, coming, our crowdfund that's coming up. And if you want to donate, just go to difficultbirds.com. Um, it is tax deductible. And we'll be launching that in the next few weeks. So that was actually mostly just a preview to see if the jokes landed. And they did, so that's great. <laughs> just gonna, presumably you can all hear me OK. Um, so basically, we've been working on this project since 2009 to 2010. So there's a lot of background knowledge uh, that Matt's just given you. And uh, we've, I kind of was trying to decide what to, what to tell you about in this talk, because there's just been so much that's happened. And I guess what I settled on was the last year or two of publications that we've produced, because I think they kind of represent um, some of the problems that we've identified and also some of the directions that we're going in how to solve those problems. So that's kind of, it's really the last couple of years of research that I'm going to be focusing on tonight. So just to recap some of what Matt was telling you about, swift parrots are a nomad. They move around Tasmania each year depending on where the best available food is in the landscape. So every year it's a new location, it's pretty unpredictable, it makes them a real pain to study because every year you basically have to start from scratch and find them anew in the landscape. So that's the main thing that makes working on swift parrots a real challenge. The other thing is that in terms of the kind of habitat they like when they get there, although it's pretty simple in that they need old forest and food, once they actually get to that old forest and want to find somewhere to nest, they're actually quite picky. And of the available tree cavities in the average patch of forest, only about 5% of them are actually suitable for swift parrots to make a nest. 
And the reason that Swifties are so picky is that they must be bloody delicious because literally everything tries to eat them. Um, and the types of hollows that they prefer have a small entrance and most of the Tasmanian native predators have pretty fat heads. So it's a really great way to passively defend your nest by selecting a good hollow. So it's really important to have a good hollow. Um, unfortunately, those Swifties are critically endangered and we've recently done some modelling that shows that within the next 16 or so years we could have up to a 95% decline if you just considered the impact of sugar glider predation alone. That doesn't take into account the known potential uh, 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 consequences of habitat loss, disease, running into chain link fences and windows and things like that. They really are dumb sometimes. So we know a lot of things kill these birds, but just sugar gliders alone are enough to drive this population to extinction pretty quickly. So that's why we're so concerned. Also, incidentally, sugar gliders are introduced. And we recently did some genetic work that demonstrated that they're actually super inbred and very closely related to a population in Victoria. So there's no doubt anymore that sugar gliders are an introduced species to Tasmania. So that's why this is such a big problem for swift parrots, because it's a new predator. So, in the last few years, our research has really focused on, on these four key questions. Firstly, we wanted to know whether you can use nest boxes uh, as a conservation tool, because it's a pretty standard tool for a lot of wildlife programs, and we wanted to know whether it would work for swift parrots. We also wanted to know where the gliders are relative to where the parrots are, because you know gliders are pretty much everywhere that we see swift parrots nesting, but we don't really know very much about the gliders themselves, so we needed to understand that better. Also, we wanted to know that if nest boxes worked, can you actually develop a glider-proof nest box, which would be a pretty handy tool in places where you know that birds are going to get eaten. Finally, it's really important to understand whether being able to breed occasionally on islands when the flower draws the population to these safe nesting places, is that actually enough to support the swift parrot population? Or is this one population that is just going to get um, driven to extinction by glider predation, irrespective of whether or not some birds breed on islands. So these are the four key research pro projects that we've been working on in the last couple of years. So to start with um, is the question of nest boxes. So a couple of years ago, we crowdfunded, um, I think it was like $80,000 in a week, um, courtesy of the support of the internet, There's many people in this room. So thanks for that. And that's an example of one of the nest boxes that you helped to pay for. In the end, we put up about 500 nest boxes across Tasmania, and it really enabled us to do some, some pretty neat stuff, and certainly the first time it's been tried in the wild for swift parrots. So using Matt's amazingly uh, uh, spatially vast coverage of survey sites, and all the blood, sweat and actual tears of the people that work on this project to actually find where these buds are and, and understand something about where the flower is going to be. We actually have developed a, uh, an ability now to kind of go around the forest and make a pretty good prediction about where the coming season's flower is going to be. And so in 2015, we had a pretty strong idea that in the following year, 2016, Bruni Island was going to have a really great flowering year. So in advance of that, in the winter of uh, 2016, before the spring breeding season, we went out and deployed a whole lot of nest boxes across North Bruni Island. We also had a group of volunteer arborists come down from Melbourne uh, to help us carve tree hollows into trees using chainsaws. So it's kind of a perverse, positive use of chainsaws for the conservation of swift parrots. So that was nice. And we did that at three key locations on North Bruni Island. And the ultimate idea that we had was understanding whether you're actually going to be producing a healthy and happy nestling in a nest box that's equivalent quality and the equivalent likelihood of survival to birds bred in natural hollows. Because there's some research out there that suggests that some nest boxes, if they're too hot or too cold, might not be so great for the nestling development. You might end up with higher or lower mortality or whatever. So we wanted to understand, does artificial habitat provide equivalent quality habitat to natural? And really, I've kind of given the game away by, by showing that photo, because birds did use their nest boxes. Um, and it was quite interesting. So across North Bruni Island, this is, this is zoomed in on North Bruni. Um, the ferry, uh, for people that are familiar, you'd catch the ferry to about here. This is the big hill uh, immediately behind the ferry. This is Lodge Hill um, and Yellow Bluff. The, the cheesery is down here, and Dens Point is somewhere up here. <laughs> 
the cheeser is actually very good for orientation and lunch, so thanks. <laughs> anyway, these circles represent the uh, uh, locations of individual nest boxes deployed. And because Roberts Hill has such a large area of forest, we put a lot more boxes there, and um, also because we thought more birds would nest there. And so this map up here basically represents um, it's, it's like a heat map, basically, of bud development. And the more blue it is, the more bud there was. Um, and you can see, even though uh, at the, at, from across the whole uh, of North Bruny Island, there was, on average, quite a lot of bud, most of it was really concentrated just in these two areas. And it was really interesting because at the broad scale, even though both of these locations had quite a lot of bud, most of the swift parrots actually nested just in this one location. So although swift parrots are moving uh, and selecting habitat from across Tasmania, even at these kind of local scales, and even at the even more local scales, they're kind of funneling into these smaller and smaller areas of habitat. And really, I mean, that's only about two kilometers squared on Roberts Hill, so it's a tiny little patch of habitat. Uh, and there's 110 known swift parrot nests on Roberts Hill. Uh, and we found most of the nests for swift parrots that we monitored that year on, in that one location. And so it was really a wonderful success. Lots of swift parrots, first ever records of birds using nest boxes. It was great. But the interesting thing was that it seemed like there was a distinct preference for swift parrots depending on whether it was an artificial or a natural resource. So 83% of the natural hollows that we checked on Roberts Hill were actually occupied. And it seemed like birds were arriving at those natural nests, starting nesting in natural nests about two weeks earlier than they were in nest boxes. And only about a quarter of the nest boxes that we put out on Roberts Hill actually ended up being occupied. And in terms of the carvings with the chainsaws, only about 4% of those were occupied. So boxes were less popular than natural hollows and carvings were way less popular than everything else. And all the artificial stuff was delayed in its uptake. So whether or not birds are preferentially filling up the natural hollows and, and the natural habitat and then spilling over into the, um, into the artificial stuff or whether there's some other behavioural preference going on, we don't really know, but it was a really distinct uh, a delay in uptake and less uptake uh, compared to natural uh, resources. Interestingly, though, there was no difference between birds raised in nest boxes versus natural hollows. That was good. That, that, was, that was very positive in terms of a management outcome. So the next question, which is not exactly related to the nest box question, but we'll bring them together in the question after, is how widespread are sugar gliders? Basically, when we first discovered the sugar glider issue um, in Tasmania, uh, very little had really been done. And effectively, every year that the swift parrots would move to a new location, we'd get a range extension for sugar gliders to a new location. So pretty much everywhere the parrots were turning up, there were already gliders there waiting to eat them. Um, and that bird died in the photo. So we wanted to know where are they, um, and that's particularly important because some of the earlier work that we did indicated that nest survival in swift parrots was positively correlated with the extent of forest cover, of mature forest cover in the local landscape. So in big patches of old growth forest, the swift parrot nests had a higher likelihood of surviving than if they were nesting in clapped out little areas. So we wanted to understand, is there something special about big forest versus little forest? We, we don't really know. So we sent an honours student out at night for a month to find out because <laughs> we're that kind of group. <laughs> so that poor guy went out and surveyed 100 sites in the southern for forest. This is just a black and white map of the same area that Matt showed you earlier, um, it, the, the severely deforested landscape south of Hobart. Um, so he went out and surveyed a whole lot of sites repeatedly um, over about a month and used uh, the calls of an owl uh, to... to survey sugar gliders because when the owls sing, the sugar gliders literally like shout in fright. So it's a really great way to <laughs> detect whether sugar gliders are present or not at night. Um, so using this totally ethical technique, we were able to detect that sugar gliders occurred actually in 80% of the sites that we surveyed. So 80 out of 100 sites in the southern forest had sugar gliders living there. So most of that area is occupied by sugar gliders. We also specifically looked at the effect of, of mature forest extent on the likelihood that a glider was going to be present at a site. 
and we found that there was a positive effect. So the more mature forest at a site, the more likely it was to be occupied by these bastards. <laughs> so bringing those two questions together, the obvious, the obvious question is, if you're going to go to the effort of crowdfunding money for boxes to deploy where there are sugar gliders, are you just feeding sugar gliders? How can you, can you actually protect nest boxes from these creatures? Because um, this is an unprotected nest box and you can see the glider is about to go in where it ate a bird. So given how widespread sugar gliders are and given that there is very severe predation on swift parrots. Literally, in some locations of the swift parrot breeding range, 100% of the nests fail, and often that will include the adult females and, the, and her offspring being eaten. So it's not like they're just eating eggs, they eat whatever they find. So given how severe it is uh, in natural hollows, and given how severe it's likely to be in unprotected nest boxes, we really needed to figure out something outside the box to, uh, <laughs> to address the sugar glider problem. So we invented the possum keeper adderers. This was another crowdfund that we did last year um, where, we, uh, where the internet gave us about $80,000 um, in a week to uh, develop these solar powered light sensitive doors. Um, this is the possum keeper adderer part and this is just a camera to monitor what's going on. So last year, um, this paper is, is, is currently under review but this is a sneak peek at the results. Um, last year, uh, we used tree martens, which are another little passerine that really loves these nest boxes. I, I wish swift parrots used these nest boxes to the extent that martens do, because all of them are occupied by tree martens. So given how abundant they were, and given that gliders also like to eat martens, we used them as a surrogate for swift parrots in this case. And we basically picked three sites and we had arrays of 20 nest boxes, some of which were protected with PKOs, some of which were just um, plain nest boxes. And we basically monitored, using these cameras, the nest success. And it was really a very stark result, like super stark. PKOs basically more than halved um, uh, the likelihood of nest failure. And in fact, um, even though gliders actually attempted to get into the PKO equipped boxes up to like 14 times, I think was the maximum. I think the average was about five predation attempts per PKO equipped nest box. All the nests uh, with PKOs survived. In contrast, the un or the non-PKO nest boxes, all of the all of the nests that failed failed because of sugar gliders, and they all failed on the first go that a sugar glider tried to attack them. So the result was very stark. And it was also quite interesting that even though some of the PKO nests failed, they failed for other reasons that bird nests fail, for kind of natural reasons. In contrast, the non-PKO bird nests were eaten so quickly in the nesting cycle that they actually didn't have a chance to fail from natural causes. It was always predation as the cause of failure in the non-PKO nest boxes. So again, very, very stark and quite encouraging. And that's a tree martin in the middle um, image there. That's what they look like when they're not being eaten. This is what they look like when they are being eaten. I just want to share some of the pain that we have in our daily job here for swift parrots. <laughs> so PKO is super, super effective. And in those locations where 100% of the swift parrots get eaten, we call them the death zones, um, in our death zones, they could actually be quite useful because these death zones often support some of the best hollows in the local landscape and as a consequence, that's where the gliders are and as a, and as a consequence of the hollows, that's where the swift parrots are attracted to. So maybe in death zones, if we litter that at those kinds of areas with PKO equipped nest boxes, some fraction of the birds that arrive at those locations might actually survive. Unfortunately though, it is a totally unrealistic approach to use PKOs at the broad scale. These things cost about 400 bucks a pop by the time you tally up all the tree climbing and the equipment and the, hour and the man hours. So really, in terms of actually rolling this out across the large scale, it's not gonna happen. So, <laughs> so we wanted to know, uh, that's, that's the end of that story. The next question that we had to ask was on these on these journeys that the swift parrots take around Tasmania each year, if it's the flip of the coin whether they end up on an island or on the glider infested mainland, is there actually enough reproduction and recruitment that happens on those occasions when they end up on islands that it's going to be enough to buffer the population from the severe threat of sugar gliders? 
there's a couple of ways to address this question, but we basically looked at it using DNA. So it would be way easier if Swift Parrots just nested on Bruni Island, not least of all because it's no further than 40 minutes from the cheesery. <laughs> Islands are actually occupied quite frequently across um, the period that we've been studying these birds. They've, they've nested there um, at least five or six times, so it's, it's pretty regular. And you know, everyone's, everyone's quite hopeful that islands could sustain these birds. So basically, no one had ever really analysed uh, the population genetic structure of these birds. So what that means is, is there a self-sustaining, isolated population of birds that is genetically different on islands compared to the Tasmanian mainland? It's kind of an indirect way of evaluating whether these birds stay put or whether the two, whether the island and, island and mainland populations mix up each year. So we use genetic te techniques to see if there was one or two populations. So, of course, there's only one single fully mixed population, and we predicted that anyway on the basis of Matt's results. These birds appear to be fully mixed because in some years there are no birds on islands, and it turns out that the genetic data totally bear that out. Unfortunately, though, for swift parrots, this effectively confirms the worst case scenario from our population viability model. So that model predicted the 94% decline over 16 years, assuming there was one single population. And this genetic data actually confirms that yes, in fact, there is one single population and that key prediction is true. So really, it kind of, uh, it's, it's kind of the worst case scenario uh, with regard to their population structure and it also reaffirms how these severe local scale threats like deforestation or sugar glider predation can escalate into a population level problem for this species. So, over the last couple of years, this research has really been targeted in understanding how to better manage these birds. And ultimately, at the end of the day, even though PKOs and nest boxes are a lot of fun and they make for, for great crowd funds, at the end of the day, unless we're protecting enough habitat over enough area, swift parrots are likely to continue their decline into extinction. Apart from anything else, sugar gliders are doing all they can to help swift parrots go extinct. They occur all over the Tasmania. They occur in abundance in some of the best swift parrot habitat on the mainland. And we really need to act quite urgently to overcome that threat at the small scale in concurrence with dealing with deforestation at the large scale. Unfortunately, these nest boxes and PKOs aren't a silver bullet, but they are a tool that we can use at small scales to make small differences in addition to protecting habitat. Unfortunately though, as I say, the clock is ticking, so really there's not that much time. The fact that Matt's two red dots in that graph appeared in the last two years indicates that clearly something is happening that's worrying that we don't have the ability to explain just yet, but we think we understand why it's happening. And as Shannon showed with the orange-bellied parrot, Collapse of a population can happen really, really quickly. In that case, it was only about five or so years where the population went from about 40 to five nestlings recruited each year. So really, it doesn't take long for these things to collapse and cascade into a catastrophe. So we really need to act now. There's really just no more time to wait. Thanks. Thank you. It's a cheery evening, isn't it? <laughs> uh, all right. Now, the, this whole thing this evening has been graciously pulled together by the Wilderness Society and BirdLife Tasmania. Our next speaker is uh, Eric Verla from BirdLife Tasmania, a passionate advocate for all birds in Tasmania, it says here. I'm sure he's met most of them. Um, now, Eric will be speaking at a public meeting next week. You've all got the flyer in Hobart. There's a lunchtime town hall meeting to highlight the massive development plans for the East Coast, like the New Cambria Art and Culture Town south of Swansea. That sounds fancy. Uh, clearance for urban development is an issue for Swifties and OBPs. Is that the, um, the dam they want to build for the, the fish gill? That's, uh, that's another one. Right. God damn it. Why did we move here? Um, Eric, the marvellous Eric, completed his PhD in population ecology in America, involved in research and the conservation of Tasmania's birds and their habitats for 40 years, Eric. 
Uh, the primary research foci are seabirds and shorebirds. Oh, do you do penguins? Okay. Has published more than 120 peer-reviewed papers in national and international journals and over 150 technical reports and popular articles an adjunct researcher at the University of Tasmania, where Eric teaches undergraduates and supervises higher degree students, and even better, is the convener of BirdLife Tasmania. We all love BirdLife Tasmania. It's a regional branch of Australia's oldest national conservation organisation, BirdLife Australia, men and women of Australia, Dr Eric Vella. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. All right. Um, first of all, just to uh, to reinforce um, Vicar's thanks to you all. Uh, this is something that um, BirdLife Tasmania and, and Wilderness Society put together. I uh, thank you all for coming along uh, this evening to to contribute to this event. Um, as as my gracious uh, MC mentioned, uh, much more of a seabird and, and coastal person than than a woodland bird person. But I have actually been involved in um, some work on uh, rainbow lorikeets, which is something I'm just going to talk about very briefly uh, this evening, just to um, um, introduce another dimension or another facet to the discussions around about um, swift parrots and other birds and. I need to whip. She's always tempted to see is the laser working. Sorry. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm going to talk tonight about rainbow lorikeets, muscle lorikeets, and the relationship that we have and the threats that we now believe that may be facing um, swift parrots, uh, certainly from, uh, from these birds. So I'll, I'll start off with a very quick introduction to the musk lorikeet. It's a native species. It's present um, when I find the laser, which is there. The map shows the distribution here from southern Queensland all the way through New South Wales, Victoria, South East, South Australia and all of Tasmania. Um, it's probably one of the first species that people see when they fly into Hobart. There's usually musk lorikeets feeding in all the flowering gums um, over at the Hobart airport. Uh, it's a very vocal bird, it's a very conspicuous bird, it flies around very quickly. Uh, it's very easy to confuse it with a swift parrot. It's not. Uh, I don't have the wonderful red crosses across the, uh, the pictures that were used earlier on. Um, and recently, in the last few years, there's been some evidence of population decreases in the northern parts of its range. So we may be actually seeing a contraction on the mainland, at least, for this particular species distribution. Uh, and here's just a picture of uh, a male. Uh, the male has more colouring around the head, stronger colouring in the red and the, and the blue on the face. And here's a female, and this is quite a, a, a typical posture that you'll see musk lorikeets feeding on, on flowering gums uh, in southeast Tasmania. I think most people would probably be familiar with uh, the, the rainbow lorikeet. Uh, if you've ever travelled to, to the mainland, uh, many people like to get the photograph of them standing like this with a rainbow lorikeet from fingertip to fingertip and uh, lorikeet um, droppings all the way down on the back of the, the arms and on, on your backs as well. Um, so they're a native species to Australia, they're present in Indonesia as well, so they're quite a widespread distri uh, distribution for the species. Um, they're introduced uh, as, a, as a vagrant, sorry, as a feral population uh, in Perth and there's a now a, a vagrant population uh, in the uh, Australian Capital Territory. So they are slowly spreading their, um, their distribution in Australia. And from little population data that we do have, all the populations that we, we are aware of in Australia are increasing. We've actually had records in Tasmania since the 1840s. So even the early settlers on the north coast of Tasmania were seeing rainbow lorikeets, and it's believed that these birds are quite capable of just flying across Bass Strait. I mean, they're, they're a fast flyer, a powerful flyer, and we believe that the, the, the records from northern Tasmania from the 1840s onwards are uh, simply natural movement of these birds across Bass Strait. We've had records in southeastern Tasmania certainly uh, since the 1960s, uh, onwards, and it's believed that these birds in southeast Tasmania have been aviary escapees, either deliberately released um, because somebody buys a, a, a rainbow lorikeet and after a while decides that oh, Polly's better off out in the wild rather than uh, in a cage and it's released, or they're just uh, escapees. Um, most of the escapees have not succeeded, and it's only really in the last five or ten years that we've seen a very rapid increase in the numbers of uh, rainbow lorikeet records in Tasmania and an expansion in their, in their range. 
So until about 20 years ago, most of the records were from the northern half of the state, and particularly the north coast of um, Tasmania. If we look at a map now on the left-hand side and shows you all the records of rainbow lorikeets um, that have been recorded in Tasmania, um, you'll see there's a you'll see there's a very large concentration up here on the northwest coast, and that reflects still an ongoing traffic of, of rainbow lorikeets across the uh, across the, the state. There's certainly a concentration now of records in the um, in the Tamar Valley, certainly around Launceston, but slowly expanding from the from the Tamar. Uh, focus around Launceston, and, and then you have a very large cluster of points down here in the southeast. And in discussions with the Avery, uh, the Avery culturalists uh, in Tasmania, uh, the rainbow lorikeet is the most uh, favoured, the most common bird in or parrot in captivity in Tasmania. It's the, the bird that everyone wants to have because of its colour. Uh, and so we believe a lot of these, uh, the recent expansion in the southeast. Uh, is simply people either deliberately releasing or these birds escaping from captivity. And this graph shows you uh, from 1960 to end of last year, the number of uh, rainbow lorikeets in the wild in Tasmania. And you can see that for the first uh, 45 years, we basically had very little, just ones and twos, incidental records from around the state. And then suddenly we've had this massive jump uh, where we're getting more than 200 records a year. And last year we had almost 900 records of rainbow lorikeets in the wild in Tasmania. So we're seeing a massive increase, massive expansion. And so the question is, well, what consequences does that have for our native birds? The rainbow lorikeet has been declared by Dipupri as an emerging invasive species, which is a polite way of saying they're recognising that it's expanding, it's increasing. Um, at the moment, the, the Dipupri don't have the capacity to eradicate the species, so their policy is to contain the populations that you saw on the northwest coast around Launceston and down here in the southeast. They want to try and contain them so there is no further spread in these species, um, in these populations. Um, uh, beyond those, that current population size. Uh, it's recently been uh, established in New Zealand, um, but the New Zealand government has a much more proactive approach. They're actually going out and capturing every bird, either returning them to, to breeding facilities or destroying the birds. They don't want the rainbow lorikeet to establish in New Zealand. Um, De Pipui uh, now clearly recognises that the, the rainbow lorikeet poses a serious threat to our agriculture. So, yeah, BirdLife Tasmania has been working with the TFGA to try and get the, some ad action by the government to try and protect our primary industry. If the government doesn't want to protect our native species, maybe they'll do something to protect our primary industries. We're not getting much luck with that particular uh, approach either. And you'll remember the, um, well, sorry, here's the, here's the map again. This is the map I just showed. A lot of the uh, distribution of the rainbow lorikeets in Tasmania overlap with the uh, orchard areas down here in the Derwent and the Sorrel areas, the vineyards up in the, the Tamar, and then again some of the, the cropping areas up in the northwest coast. So there is a real potential for having an impact on our agriculture. Having said all that, I'll jump to the potential for impacts on native species. Uh, this is a picture of a sulphur crested cockatoo. It's suffering from the beak and feather disease. Uh, it's something that um, is a native species. It's endemic to Australia's parrots. But what's happening is that the introduction of the rainbow lorikeet poses another risk, another vector, another source of transmitting the disease amongst native uh, parrots in, uh, in Tasmania. And certainly things like the musk lorikeet, the green rosellas and the swift parrots are all susceptible to this disease anyway. What they don't need is another vector, another way of this disease bouncing around in the environment. The other problem that we have with rainbow lorikeets is they are a potential competitor for food and for nesting sites for the musk lorikeets, which is its closest relative in Tasmania, but also with swift parrots and green rosellas. So it's competing with, food for, with these species for their food, for nesting sites, and potentially carrying disease around the environment. So again, here's the, the map of the rainbow lorikeets in Tasmania. And the map, this is a variation on the map that um, the Matt showed you in terms of the distribution of the uh, swift parrot. Swift parrot concentrated very much down here in the southeast corner in terms of the breeding distribution. Uh, you remember there was a bit of a, a breeding population uh, at one point in time on the northwest coast. 
the distribution of the rainbow lorikeet in Tasmania in terms of its concentrations very similarly to the uh, distribution of swift parrots in Tasmania. And you recall that Sharon, Sharon, Shannon, sorry, mentioned uh, the potential for hybridization between these species. Well, in fact, here is a hybrid musk lorikeet, rainbow lorikeet at a feeding station in Hobart. So it's not just an abstract potential hypothetical. It's a real you know, issue where we have the risk of losing genetic identity of some of our native species by the introduction of these uh, uh, rainbow lorikeets. We don't know if these uh, hybrids are sterile or fertile. It's only just happening now. This record is about five years old. We haven't seen uh, too many more of these, but the fact that we're seeing them means it's happening in the wild. The problem that we have in dealing with rainbow lorikeets is people love these things. They're nice and colorful. They, they sing a lot. They're, people are feeding them. They're putting out um, food in, in uh, their gardens. And so there's a community undermining the efforts by the Tepipui to control these populations, to minimize the population by putting out supplementary food. So a part of my talk tonight is to ask you that if you do have rainbow lorikeets in your garden, let the people we know, let BirdLife Tasmania know, so that we can map how these populations are spreading, what the numbers are looking like. We need to get a good handle on what's going on with these invasive species to know that we can then have some sense about what's going to happen with musk lorikeets and swift lorikeets into the, uh, into the future and swift parrots uh, into the future in Tasmania. Very quick, very brief, that was all I'm going to talk about tonight and then I'll answer some questions later on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Mutant lorikeets. How terrifying. Will you come around and catch them at people's houses? I won't personally, right. but yes, there are oh. efforts to catch. Lorikeet catches. Uh, well, science is all well and good, isn't it? But sometimes you need, sometimes you need the law. And uh, uh, both BirdLife Tasmania and the Wilderness Society are constantly actively campaigning to achieve new national environment laws that actually work to protect species and special places. We've heard plenty tonight about how it's not working uh, and the impact of this on species, and that's why you might need uh, a legend of the law and environment movement in Tasmania. Jess Feely, who in fact has a, law, has a science degree, I'm told. I was going to mock her <laughs> unkindly <laughs> for not even being an honorary scientist like me, but. She's in fact more of a scientist than I am. Uh, Jess is principal lawyer with the uh, Environmental Defenders Office in Tasmania, which is a community legal centre specialising in public interest environmental law, with a particular interest in coastal management, uh, forestry and biodiversity, and climate change issues. Jess has contributed to national audits of threatened species law and the operation of the RFA. Oh. <laughs> no, I, I don't know what it stands for. Oh, the Regional Forest Agreement. Oh, boo, everybody. Uh, all right. Uh, taking up many of the policy failures identified by Matt, Dayan and Eric, Jess will outline some of the key changes needed to improve nature laws and apologise for what a blunt weapon the law can be. Yeah, right. I didn't write that. I figured it. Oh. Thank you very much. And as you can see, I, we already have a, a um, marsupial avatar for EDO TAS, but I'm considering lobbying to get it changed because I think the one that you did is a much, much more ba badass. <laughs> so um, I, I'm really here just to sort of um, address, as, as um, First Dog said, some of the issues that were raised by both Matt and Dee. Um, I'm very conscious that it's late and, and uh, people are keen to get into question time, so I'm not going to try and take you through all of the problems with the law because there's not enough time in the world. Um, but essentially I'm just here to give you a bit of a tasting plate on some of the issues that, are, that result in a lot of the destruction that we've seen being entirely lawful. Um, and what EDO TAS and um, a lot of the organisations who have um, partnered to bring this um, to you tonight are trying to do about that and some of the suggestions we have for how to improve the situation. 
Um, I'm also very conscious that um, in case it wasn't obvious that I'm a lawyer, not a scientist, my photos aren't of cute birds, they're of documents. So I, apolo I apologise, but I didn't realise until I put it all together. But um, we, we, EDO TAS and the EDO Network across Australia has done a lot of work um, looking at the issues, speaking to the scientists and identifying where the law is failing miserably and trying to work out how we can address that. So there's lots of documents. Um, available on our website, so for the nerds out there I would highly encourage you to have a look at those and there are some hard copies on the desk over there. In terms of the tasting plate, problems with the Tasmanian legislation, no critical habitat is actually listed in our laws. Um, there's no opportunities to appeal against dam approvals on the basis that you're challenging the scientific findings. So you can challenge the process, but there's no opportunity to appeal against what um, a decision is made on the basis of the science. There's no appeals against decisions to approve uh, forestry activities. There's broad exemptions from the planning schemes for forestry activities particularly. There's very poor regulation of firewood collection, and so that's, that's certainly an issue um, in relation to swift parrot habitat, uh, particularly in um, the kind of Buckland area. There have been large swathes of, of um, good quality habitat destroyed by illegal um, firewood collection, which is unlawful, but unfortunately the laws make it very difficult to actually prosecute those things. Um, a lot of, I guess, uh, what Matt was highlighting with the RFA exemption, and I'll, I'll talk to the RFA exemption in a second, um, is that the RFA exemption essentially delegates the Commonwealth's responsibility down to the state government, and as we can see, the state legislation is really failing to um, hold up its end of the bargain. But there are also some limits of the EPBC Act itself. So even if the RFA exemption didn't exist and the, the Federal Minister was able to be involved, um, there are also some, some restrictions on the application of that. So in terms of threshold tests, you have to demonstrate that the impact will be significant. From the swift parrot's perspective, that's pretty easy. It's a critically endangered species, so most habitat loss is going to be considered to be significant. But for other species, that reaching that threshold of demonstrating that an impact will be significant can often mean that the federal government doesn't get involved. The, federal, the EPBC Act only applies for listed threatened species and listed ecological communities. And there's often significant delays in that listing process. Um, the swift parrot was uplisted to critically endangered by the IUCN, and it took almost a year for that, that uplisting to be recognised in our federal legislation. There's a, a range of ecological communities that have been recommended by the, the Commonwealth Threatened Species Scientific Committee for listing as critically endangered, but the, the politicians that have to make that decision are delaying the, deci delaying the confirmation of that, and I'll talk in a minute about some of the implications of that. Implementation of recovery plans. So there are requirements under the EPBC Act for recovery plans to be in place for listed species but often the implementation of those falls down. So they're documents that identify what the key threats are, what we should all be doing to address those, those threats, but really the, um, the mechanisms in the legislation to force action are pretty poor. And then the other thing I just wanted to talk briefly about was offsets and over-reliance on this idea that if you um, destroy habitat somewhere, it's justified as long as you can protect habitat somewhere else. And certainly, as we've heard tonight, in the case of the swift habitat, we should be protecting all the habitat. So identifying an area and just saying as long as we protect someone somewhere else, it's okay for this to go, really doesn't work, particularly with critically endangered species. So just um, the RFA exemption essentially says that if a forestry operation in Tasmania, well, if a forestry operation is undertaken in accordance with a regional forest agreement, it's exempt from the approval requirements under the EPBC Act. So the federal legislation that deals with list, federally listed threatened species will not apply to forestry operations undertaken in accordance with the Regional Forest Agreement. So from the swift parrot's perspective, that basically means one of the most significant threats to that species is entirely outside the jurisdiction of the Commonwealth Minister to deal with. There are some limits to its operation. It doesn't apply in World Heritage Areas and it doesn't apply in Ramsar-listed wetlands, so f even forestry activities in those areas will be subject to the federal legislation. It also only applies to commercial forestry operations, so it doesn't apply to broad-scale land clearing generally. If you're wanting to clear land for agricultural purposes, you will still be subject to the Environment Protection by the EPBC Act. The justification that's generally given for the RFA exemption is that the RFA provides an equivalent standard to the assessment that would otherwise be undertaken under the federal laws. And as we've seen tonight, it just doesn't. When you, when you see swift parrot habitat being cleared, 
you would have to question whether or not the EPBC Act, an EPBC Act assessment would actually allow for that to happen. The um, last 10-year review that was undertaken of the EPBC Act, called the Hawke Review, um, looked in a lot of detail at the RFA exemption and, and how it was working. It didn't go so far as to say that the RFA exemption should be removed, but it did recognise that it should be contingent upon essentially proof that it was providing an equivalent standard and that that should be reviewed uh, regularly and in, the, in instances where it was clear that those equivalent standards weren't being met, then it, uh, the opportunity for the Minister to reintroduce the application of the EPBC Act should occur. The Commonwealth Government didn't adopt those um, recommendations um, and Environmental Defenders offices around Australia undertook a review which made it clear that in no state are the RFA um, provisions or the threatened species laws of an equivalent standard to the EPBC Act. So we will continue to advocate very strongly for the removal of that RFA exemption to give the Federal Minister a jurisdiction again over um, any kind of habitat clearing that's affecting endangered species. There have been a number of legal challenges to the application of the RFA, so you might remember the Wylankta challenge um, nearly 10 years ago now, um, that looked at whether or not forestry operations in Tasmania were in fact being undertaken in accordance with the Tasmanian RFA. When, they, when the uh, Federal Court found that it wasn't, they changed the RFA rather than actually changing their, their practices. They changed the RFA to make it clear that forestry activities in Tasmania undertaken in accordance with Tasmanian laws were being undertaken in accordance with the, the RFA. Um, there's also currently a challenge in Victoria looking at whether or not clearing in Victoria is undertaken in accordance with the RFA on the basis that they haven't submitted their last um, two lots of five yearly reviews. So, that's, so we're waiting on the outcome of that. But it's very limited, the opportunities to challenge um, any, of, any of these, um, the operation of any forestry activities. And that RFA exemption creates some real difficulties for getting federal involvement in an issue of national significance. The other issue which I wanted to just touch on briefly is offsets, which tend to be over relied on. So there's, in theory, a mitigation hierarchy whereby you should try and avoid impact on habitat minimise the impact on habitat, if you're going to have an impact to try and mitigate that, and if all of those things fail, then you can offset the impact. Um, so, so offset what are called residual adverse impacts. In theory, it should be offset with a like for like, so whatever you're taking, you should be protecting elsewhere. And there's usually some sort of overall environmental benefit tests, um, which can involve ratios, which can be up to five, so if you're losing one hectare, you have to protect five hectares somewhere else. It's supposed to be additional, so it's not just protection that would have been offered anyway, it has to actually be new protection, and there has to be some permanence for that protection. So in theory, that all sounds like it could possibly work. In practice, offsets are used to justify approvals. Um, so I'll go through very quickly an example of all of these failings sort of coming together with the Prosser River Water Scheme, so the, the Fishgill Dam that you were talking about um, just before. So this is a proposal that's currently um, been referred to the, the Federal Minister. It's not um, a forestry operation, it's clearing that um, will be undertaken for dams. So it doesn't, it's not subject to that RFA exemption and it will be subject to assessment by the Federal Minister. It's a dam, um, you can see the location uh, there in, uh, on the east coast. And the dam is to provide water to Taswater for a golf course and for the Tassel o Oakhampton Bay um, salmon farming operations. So just replicating the maps that Matt um, and Dee have shown previously, these are the swift parrot um, uh, important habitat areas. And you can see that the green one on the east coast, the dam is smack bang in, in the middle of that. And if you see, this is the, the footprint of the dam, the spotted, um, the green kind of spotted area in the middle is, is black gum forest. So that's been identified as key habitat for swift parrots. So, Basically, the Glamorgan Spring Bay Council is proposing to build a dam that will involve clearing 22 hectares of very high quality swift parrot habitat in um, an identified swift parrot breeding area. And we will we'll have to wait to see whether or not that's considered acceptable by the Commonwealth Minister. The reports all indicate that this can be offset. So there's, a, there's an indication that if you lose 20 hectares, as long as you can find 70 hectares to offset it, um, it, it will be acceptable. 
and I'll leave it for question time for you to ask Matt whether or not it's in fact possible to find 70 hectares yeah. of equivalent um, uh, swift parrot habitat in that area. The other thing that this um, example is relevant to is that black gum is not currently listed, despite having listed under the EPBC Act, despite having been recommended by the Threatened Species Scientific Committee as for a critically endangered listing. So not vulnerable or rare or threatened, but critically endangered. That, and that recommendation was made in 2015. That's been sitting um, with the, the minister for quite a while. He has formally delayed that on several occasions. And the most recent justification for that delay was that there's currently an, a review going on of the impact of EPBC on agricultural operations and that he wants to delay until the outcome of that review. So again, that tells you something about the way the EPBC Act is um, conceived, that if the listing, which would provide some protection of a vegetation community that's been recognised by the government's own scientific committee as being critically endangered, has to wait until we, dis until we find out what implications that will have on agriculture, that demonstrates that it's not really about protection of the environment per se, that it's protection of the environment where it suits other interests. So, um, yes, yeah, so that um, was what I was, was saying. In terms of the, the calculation of the 70 hectares, the reports themselves, so the reports that were put in by the, the proponent, recognised that the calculation of the 70 hectares that would be available um, did not take into account any nesting hollows in the impact area nor the offset area. So they've identified the need for the offsets, but they haven't in any way guaranteed that the area is available or that if it was available it would actually provide um, adequate habitat. So just to wrap up, what are some of the solutions? There are, there are lots and lots and lots of things that would need to happen for both the federal and the, the Tasmanian laws to start operating properly, but some of the key things are that there needs to be an, international, uh, sorry, an independent national EPA. Removal of the RFA exemption would go a long way towards ensuring that um, assessment of habitat loss is taken out of the vested interests of, of kind of a state government and, and given to the, the federal minister. Requiring the federal minister to actually adopt scientific committee recommendations. Requiring the threatened fauna advisor conditions to be implemented at the state level. Establishing a critical habitat register and ensuring that anything that was on that register, any disturbance of it would be considered significant and warrant uh, federal government involvement. There'd be restrictions on whether you could actually offset the loss of critical habitat and that any critical habitat should be excluded from any, any calculation of wood supply. I think one of the things that really needs to happen is that the government needs to start providing funding to compensate private landowners for, for where their land can't be developed as a result of the need to protect for swift parrot or for other threatened species. Um, it, it is a loss of their opportunity to, to use their private land and the government has some responsibility for making sure that, um, that, they're, not, um, well, that they're compensated for that. Um, and I think the other thing is to allow third party appeals for forestry and dam approvals. And that's not just to drum up more, more business for the EDO, but it's, it's really important that there's that level of scrutiny so that people can actually interrogate these decisions and, and demonstrate to the courts that they're not being made in accordance with the objectives of the legislation. So in terms of the opportunities to act, so it's already been mentioned that there's currently a Senate inquiry into the faunal extinction crisis with submissions due by the 10th of September. So it's really important that the government hears from as many people as possible that they're concerned about the, the declining rate of threatened species. Um, th there's also a statutory review of the EPBC Act that we, will be due in 2019. So the government is expected to release the first tranche of documents um, inviting commentary on that by late this year. EOs of Australia will certainly be actively involved in um, setting out all the reasons, all the things we think need to be improved, um, but we'd encourage again as many people as possible to get your thoughts to the government about what you see as the major failings in the legislative framework we have. There's a nature laws campaign, so both TWIS and BirdLife Tasmania are members of um, Places You Love who have an ongoing nature laws campaign um, which tries to generate um, interest in amongst the general population in kind of advocating for, not, for laws that work. And you can also subscribe to the EDO Tasmania Bulletin to get updates on what's actually happening in, in this space and, um, and how you can contribute. So I would strongly encourage all of, all of you to make your voices heard, um, tell the government that we actually need nature laws that protect nature. Doesn't seem like something you'd have to remind them of, but it is. 
Um, and I think as Shannon has said, it's all about working with all of the tools that we have. So using the law, using scientists, using volunteers, everybody talking to anybody that will listen about why we need to get this framework right before it's too late. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we've got time for a few questions. Um, obviously not from the people who are leaving already. Uh, but I just wanted to, to quickly say thank you, because I mean, obviously, if you're here, you're interested. Um, and a lot of people are volunteers, and I think a lot of the work, from what I can tell, gets done by well, people who aren't on fancy science salaries, or, or uh, uh, <laughs> it's people who are actually um, turning up to things like this and, and, and doing the work. So, so I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, but isn't it nice that even though we're obviously, based on what everything they've said tonight, we're obviously completely screwed, but what a lovely team of people who are, who are, trying, to, who are trying to see us, see us through it. So, um, Vika, if you want to, if anybody has a question for the team, there's one up there. Thanks. Um, Shannon, you were talking about using radio telemetry on the OBPs, which is great to look at their habitat usage. Uh, are you going to be using that when they migrate, or will you take them off before they go on their migratory journey? Uh, I won't actually have to take them off. Um, they molt twice a year. So the idea is to put them on just after they arrive. Um, or actually, it will be the birds that we release that we put the radio transmitters on. So they'll just be glued to the tail feathers. They've been doing this in Victoria for a few years. Uh, they very reliably molt. Um, so the idea is they will molt and then they will migrate minus the transmitter. Um, it'd be lovely to put transmitters on them when they migrate, but they're not quite small enough yet. Awesome, thanks. Um, this is mostly, yeah, probably throw it at Shannon and Dee. Uh, everyone is a scientist or a lawyer and that's kind of dry and you try to keep it, I don't know, unbiased I suppose and not be too emotionally involved in that. But it, you must be emotionally involved when you're dealing with birds that you're only seeing five females, for example, flying to Melaleuca. Um, I was just wondering if you could say something about what it's like to commit your working life to something so threatened? Uh, Dee and I are not super pleasant to talk to in September <laughs> and I'd avoid <laughs> trying to have any conversations with us about how the OBPs are going. Um, yeah, it's depressing, but once you realise, okay, that's it for the season, this is what's coming back, you start to release birds, they start to establish nests, you start to feel like um, maybe it's going to be okay, you see some nestlings, if they don't all die, um, which they haven't done the last couple of years actually. Good job. Yeah, um, yeah, you start to feel some hope there, um, and by the end of the season, we're hopeful and exhausted. <laughs> I, I think uh, there's definitely that component with the OBPs where there's like two females or whatever, and then there's this component where we have like where our, our day job is going out to forests that we know have had swift parrot nests, like critically important locations that have just been cut down despite the fact that people know that they're there. We know that cutting down habitat is bad, but we just do it anyway. And so, so really, I think actually like, like the mental health of people in, in this kind of profession is like probably not talked about often enough. And like, I will speak for all of us <laughs> that like just crying on the job is just a thing that you have to do to live and survive. Like, yeah, like Nicole, I'll never forget this like terrible moment when Nicole was giving me an interview and she just said, what will you do if the OBP went extinct? And I just burst into tears and was unable to talk for about five minutes. <laughs> I felt terrible. You were a monster. <laughs> <laughs> But there's just, yeah, there is, it's, it's, it's a lot of despair and like literally like, you know, Fernanda uses the Headspace app. I run obsessively and eat as much cheese as I can. <laughs> so you just got to find ways to deal with it. 
I have a question. Of time in the southern forest. <laughs> yeah, Matt, Matt goes to logging coops to camp. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds even more depressing. I have a question for you, Matt. Those distribution maps, um, how influenced are they by your monitoring capacity? And do you think that could be improved with citizens? What's science? that, sorry? The, your distribution maps, how influenced are they by your capacity to monitor resor human resources and... Um, uh, I mean, they could they could always be slightly better, but we're pretty confident confident that um, you know that they're, they're pretty accurate. Um, the, the, what what I neglected to um, to mention is so we do have some sites along the north coast, and there still is a handful of birds um, in some years that uh, uh, breed on the north coast. Most of them die. But, um, and there's also another little pocket over near Zian on the um, west coast. It's an isolated pocket of blue gum. Um, but other than that, uh, yeah, it's pretty tight. It's all published. It's all, and you know, effectively, and th there's a few, few other people in the room here who help me um, with the surveys. It's you know, th those, those maps are a pretty good reflection of where the birds are each year. If you go outside of those areas, you're going to be very lucky to, to find, a, find a bird. Uh, I think there's a question over here. I've got a, got a quick question that's been uh, called in from the uh, audience in Launceston, which is about the status of uh, habitat on the mainland, particularly in Victoria, both of these being migratory species, the Swifty and the OBP. What's the status of the habitat there and what are the main threats to habitat over there? Uh, for, you know, the swift, for swift parrots, it's been... Um, uh, you know, it's massive habitat loss uh, on the mainland, ob obviously, but uh, one of the advantages that they have, uh, that the swift, swift brats have on the mainland is there is actually heaps more habitat than there is breeding habitat available, and they're, they're not tied to a nest, so uh, they can track uh, food resources over over winter um, and you know, that, that's that's really a key thing as soon as you're 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 tied to a nest and you've got a certain area surrounding you and it, the, for OBPs in Tasmania it's the same, same thing as well and lack of fire but um, uh, and uh, in I'll, I'll throw my five cents worth in for, for orange belly parrots as well, but I, I, I don't, I personally don't think that habitat availability or food availability is, on mainland Australia is really a problem for OBPs now that their, their population is so low. It's something's going on, but but it's, you know, the population's so low, it just doesn't really make sense. Um. Yeah, questions? I think um, I would agree Sorry. with Matt there. Um, it's probably not a limiting factor now. There was a lot of habitat loss earlier. Um, I think they've done some analysis now on the mainland that's shown the um, extent of habitat hasn't changed since the 1980s, and what's going on now is that birds aren't finding habitat birds that haven't migrated before aren't finding habitat because they're not finding the big flocks of birds that would cue them into there being habitat there. I think that's sort of relatively similar for, um, for swift parrots as well as most of the mainland uh, habitat loss, you know, it was quite a while ago. Uh, it, there's, still, there's still loss going on now, of course, but... Um, the vast majority of it, and the same with Regent Honey Eater that Dee was talking about before. Most of that habitat loss is historical, and now we're dealing with all the fallout from from that loss. Um, I've got a two-part question. Um, so, what's happening in Tassie is happening around the rest of the world. They call it the um, sixth mass extinction crisis. Um, 
how do you how do you kind of characterise what's happening in Tasmania with that as the context? And part two, how important is public awareness or, or lack of awareness in terms of you know uh, endangered species? Um, I'm hogging the microphone, but. Um, I think that OBPs and 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 swift parrots uh, are a really good um, uh, comparison because they're very different issues. Um, and so, when you're talking about raising awareness or, or, or whatever for swift for, for swift parrots, you know, we really still do have a chance. Um, we can, you know, we're looking at at. <laughs> We're looking at, at predator at sugar glider control. Um, you know, if if you know by some magical um, you know laws um, we stop uh, cutting down habitat, recognise okay, this stuff needs to stay. You know, that's possible. Whereas for OBPs and a whole lot of other species around the world. It's, yeah, much, you know, there's a lot more unknowns, whereas at least for some species there's knowns that we're not, you know, we're just not fulfilling our obligations. Oh, I'd just like to address the elephant in the room <laughs> of uh, this whole OBPs don't have a chance thing. Um, in my day job, I sometimes do some math <laughs> and uh, we have, it's harder and, the, and the, the, I mean, translocation 101 is don't translocate unless you know what the threats are. Our options are to let the OBP go or keep trying. So there are things we can do and that's why we've invested in expanding the captive population to provide a source of birds. Um, it, we can grow the population, but we need to address survival as well. And it's, I know you're just doing it in jest, but it's a really important point. And it links into the mental health stuff as well. You can't keep going yeah. week after week after week thinking there's no hope and I wouldn't be doing the job if there wasn't. It's the stuff we don't And I just want to uh, address the issue about education and engagement, and it's critical. Um, the, the last thing the government wants is an educated, informed you know, public that can you know, discuss you know, issues intelligently. We're seeing um, you know, a lack of information. Uh, we're relying increasingly on volunteers, community groups, um, you know, people that are dedicating their lives to do something. And we need to get the message out, we, because otherwise the legacy that we leave you know, future generations is a world without birds, and you just can't imagine something like that. You know you got Well, I'm just really going to repeat what I said before, that the law doesn't get changed because politicians suddenly decide that it's a good idea. They're only going to do it if people tell them that that's what they want. So I think public awareness that the laws aren't working, that it's not just because someone's done something unlawful, actually the legal framework allows and encourages all of what we've seen tonight. So I think awareness of that and then actually voicing the fact that that's not okay is really important. I just wanted to go back to the thing about um, what these two species kind of mean in context of the broader extinction crisis. And from my perspective, because I kind of straddle both these worlds, I find it really um, that both species are, it's like a microcosm of like broader things that are happening. Like, for example, if you look at the swift parrot, <clears throat> it's a case where we know what we need to do, but we're turning a blind eye and allowing things that we know that, are, that shouldn't happen to happen. Whereas in the case of the orange bellied parrot, I mean, it's, it's, it's effectively a legacy effect that we're dealing with. Um, and the contrast, for example, like to Pipwe, like those birds would be dead already if there wasn't a captive breeding program. So you know, like to their to their credit, like it's it's actually it's actually the reason that there's still a wild population. So, like on the one hand, you've got one species where we're actively um, implementing a threatening process despite knowledge of the reason that you shouldn't do that. And on the other hand, we have a species that's significantly further down the extinction vortex, and we're now throwing resources to try and bring it back 
So it's kind of a very strange parody where you, or a paradox where you've got yeah. you're pushing one species further down the track where you will inevitably need to try and bring it back from the brink at a later date when it's too late. So it's a really kind of fascinating like contrast in the way that we deal with these two birds. We're going to take just a couple more quick questions. Yep, mine's for Jess. I just wanted to to just point out to, to people um, the lack of public scrutiny that Eric and Jess were were pointing out. Pe people would be astounded at at the lack of scrutiny, and it's just not even possible. You put in an RTI or an FOI these days, and eighty or ninety percent of it will be redacted. Just that, that that's all just the lack of public scrutiny it's it's gotten to the point where it's a joke hi Jess you mentioned uh, regulation of firewood collection I'd yeah. be interested to hear a bit more on your thoughts on that one <laughs> uh, I have lots of thoughts about that um, I think one of one of the there's a lot of work going on in the background to try and establish better frameworks for that um, but one of the issues is actually having li having a license to sell and so actually at the point of sale being able to demonstrate that someone hasn't um, obtained that uh, that would lawfully is probably the easiest way that we're ever going to be able to actually regulate because the, po the this problem that the police have is actually proving where wood has come from. So actually having licence at the point of sale is probably the most effective enforcement um, approach that has been floated with government and, and at this stage government doesn't see that as one of their priority um, issues. Um, but we'll, we'll keep beating that drum until we get some um, better enforcement options. Uh, and this one Last question up here. Yeah, um, I'm just interested in what else these uh, the gliders eat, um, and hence what e what are common birds um, that are basically long lived and in hollows like the black cockies. Are they also going to be your clients shortly? Yeah. And a serious uh, question over the horizon. So. It's, that's a two-part question, basically. The first question was about what a gliders eat the yeah. rest of the time, and pretty much anything that they can put in their mouths is what they will eat. Um, there's records of gliders eating um, things like brown antichinus, which are a fossorial kind of low-dwelling creature, like a little marsupial carnivore. They eat literally everything that they can possibly eat. So, And when they're not eating birds or mammals, they're eating insects or nectar or from eucalypts or banksias, whatever. They, they're around all the time. With regard to the second part of the question, which is about um, what about other hollow nesters? Um, so the swift parrot issue is really just, the only reason we're talking about the swift parrot is because we have 10 years of data to support our, um, our argument. The reason that you all saw the video about Zorro the mast owl dog earlier is because there are a whole host of other species in um, not only Tasmanian forests but also the mainland forests that are likely to be suffering the exact same um, consequences of landscape scale deforestation but just with no data to support um, even basic decision making. And so, uh, for instance, in the case of the mast owl, it's already a listed species in Tasmania. Uh, but just simply finding them is, is impossibly painful. And so that's why we've gone with the, with the dog, just to, just to literally be able to understand basic stuff about their ecology. And a lot of the problems, um, well, all these birds that we've heard about tonight, these are, these are difficult birds. And in one way or another, working on them and getting that kind of information is really hard. Um, and for many species, not just in Australia, um, but many species, lack of information is actually the key threat because you just don't know what to do, you don't know what's wrong, don't know how to address it, you don't know where the threats are. So really addressing these basic questions is, is critical. And if I, if I could just add to that, uh, you mentioned black cockatoos. Um, there are alarm bells starting to ring about black cockatoos around Australia. They're large birds, they're hollow nesting birds. We're, we're taking out the large trees that produce the large hollows for these species. And so there's, there is a, a, a growing awareness, concern, whatever you want to call it, that we may be actually seeing a, a, a decrease in the productivity of the black cockatoos. These are long-lived birds. What's happening is they're the adults are surviving, the population is getting older and older and older, and when those old birds 
die out, you, don't have, you haven't had the recruitment of young birds to take their place in the population. I think that's it. I, if you could thank Matt and Dee and Shannon and Eric and Jess for coming along. I hope everyone survives uh, on the way home in the storms that you, you people in Tasmania seem to have so many of. And, and can I look, can I, before we just close up, can I just take a moment also to, to thank uh, First Dog for uh, hosting tonight and also the, um, I guess, the ad advocacy and exposure he gives to issues such as this through uh, his work. So <laughs> thanks, First Dog. Um, look. Come and have a chat to us uh, at the table if you're interested in some information. Look, just to, to finally to thank the scientists, um, you know, look, truly honourable work, and the lawyer. Uh, <laughs> and sorry. You know, we've heard about some of the blood, sweat and tears. We've heard about how hard they have to work for every cent that they get to spend on their work. Um, and, uh, you know, this is a National Science Week event, and so we're celebrating science and scientists. So I want to commend you guys and say thank you very much for the work you do. It's not always... Um, beer and Skittles, but uh, it's always yeah, go, heading in the right direction, I think. So thank you. And it, look, in saying that, I guess science can only take us so far. At the end of the day, it's governments that implement the regulations that protect the habitat and so forth. And so we, re we as a community really need to keep on to our governments about doing that. We've seen uh, from some of the examples here about the, the proactive steps that are not being taken, whether it's enforcing a management plan or uh, obeying regulations and so forth. We need that to happen. But here in Tasmania, we've got a government that's proposing to reverse reserves that includes critical habitat for the swift parrot. Places like Bruny Island, Tyler's Hill, Tasman Peninsula, Wailangta, uh, the Eastern Tiers, all the way up to Douglas Apsley, there are um, you know, tens, if not hundreds of thousands of hectares in that suite that the Hodgman government is proposing to reverse and put back into uh, a logging tenure. So we're not just not taking things forward, we've got a government that's actively trying to take us backwards. So I urge you to get involved with BirdLife, uh, with the Wilderness Society, with other environment groups in Tasmania to help um, you know, plug that message, uh, keep our governments accountable uh, and ultimately um, get new laws and regulations that actually properly protect and, and actually work. So thank you very much for coming. Do take it easy going home because it's pretty nasty out there. Uh, and thanks again to all of our uh, panellists and guests. And, no, and also... I do, I do also want to acknowledge and thank volunteers, volunteers that have helped pull together tonight and also uh, there's people in Launceston that have pulled together a session as well. So thanks also to volunteers and ultimately thanks to you for coming along. Thanks very much. Good night. <laughs>